Welcome to Minority Trip Report. MTR is a podcast spotlighting stories of personal transformation and underrepresented leaders in mental health, psychedelics, and consciousness. I'm your host, Raj Saraj. If you're learning from or enjoying Minority Trip Report, please subscribe to MTR on YouTube at Minority Trip Report and follow us on Instagram at Minority Trip. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Today, my guest is Maya Bastian, who is an award-winning Tamil Canadian filmmaker and artist with roots in conflict journalism. Her work has been supported by Netflix, the Canadian Film Center, HBO, UNIOM, the Globe and Mail, and the CBC. She has exhibited internationally, including at Edinburgh Fringe, Colombo Art Biennale, and Cannes Court Metrage. Her work frequently explores the trauma related to displacement and migration. Maya, welcome. Thanks for having me. So first of all, Maya, you're recovering from what was, uh, as you were saying, a very crazy experience. Tell me about TIFF. What was that like? It's really fun, but it's a lot of work as well, especially if you live in Toronto and work in the film industry in Toronto, because you just, it's a very social atmosphere. You're meeting everybody, talking to everybody. A lot of the time you do a lot of, I do a lot of work for my computer or I'm on set, I'm on set with a few specific people. And this is an atmosphere for 10 days where you're just seeing hundreds of people and free alcohol, free food. You can imagine what it's. <laughs> It's wonderful. And I saw a lot of films also this year, which was great. And I participated in the TIFF Series Accelerator. It was the first time I, I worked, I was included in the TIFF filmmakers in that way. So that was really fun too. What is the TIFF Accelerator? The TIFF Series Accelerator is they select, I think they've had about 12 or 13 projects that are all television series. And we all get together over the course of three days and they just give us access to Disney and BBC comedy and some creators of some of my all-time favorite shows and stuff like that. So it's really wonderful. I had an amazing time. It was all women too and a lot of wow. women of color. That's amazing. What did you pitch? I have a comedy. I have a comedy called How to Be Brown, which is a really fun set in the early 2000s in Toronto, looking at race and representation and looking at diaspora. Diaspora growing up in the suburbs, as I did, of Toronto in a very white situation. And really being whitewashed, for lack of a better way to say it, and then coming to move to Toronto and not having any idea how to be brown. Didn't know. And so I made a, it's a pretty funny comedy, but setting in the early 2000s where we weren't so woke as we are now. So a lot of things, people could say a lot of things to you that they could not, cannot say now. So we're, we had a lot of fun. We shot a pilot and yeah, we had a lot of fun. We'll see. Maybe CBC or someone will pick it up and you'll get to watch it. I, I love the themes of being brown in the 2000s. I grew up somewhere else. I came to Canada in 2004, so maybe there's some overlap there. But I'm, I'm curious, what are the sort of idiosyncrasies that you've highlighted in your film and that you experienced yourself back in that time, or 2000s? And also, I'm curious about your comment about we weren't as woke back then. Maybe expand on that. <laughs> you know what? A lot of the, the show is, it talks about my experience in high school, going to high school and having classmates make fun of me and having to sit through idle racism and just laugh and smile along with it. My classmates used to say, hey, Maya, does your junk smell like curry? Like things like that, which at the time you're like, huh, funny. And then now feeling like that's really offensive and awful. And then moving to Toronto and me actually having anti-Black racism and not realizing it because I grew up in that environment. And so having to face that when I had like my first Black friend and when I had my first queer friend and the different ways that my upbringing and the way that we had to, as like one of the only brown families around, had to really dim our culture to fit in. So trying to figure that out. And I remember the first time I was on, the first time I took the TTC in Toronto, it must have been around 2001. I got on and I was amazed that I wasn't a minority. It was the first time I was in a group setting where I wasn't a minority. And it was just, it was fantastic, that feeling of freedom. And then slowly understanding, oh, wait, like slowly being like, oh, all my friends are white. How did that happen? But I was just gravitating towards white people because that's what I knew. And it took many years to open up and start making friends of color and then really accepting myself as a person of color. It took many years. I think I didn't really fully accept myself as a BIPOC person until I was maybe 29 or 30. What would you say is the, was the hardest part of accepting yourself as a BIPOC person? Understanding that I am treated differently and I'm always going to be treated differently as a woman of color. And that involves microaggressions and that involves, you know, a lot of subtleties about life. And looking back at my high school experience and my grade school experience and realizing, oh, that 
was racist. Oh, that's why they were treating me like this. That's why the principal treated me like this. That's why the teachers treated me like this. That was maybe the hardest part was to really come to terms with that I'm fundamentally treated as an, another, as the other, and what that entails for my life. And it's something I teach my daughter as well, to be strong and proud in that, but to also recognize and remember it's extra hard for you. It's always going to be extra hard for us to do anything successful in this life. That part really resonates with me because I think there's this fine line between understanding that you will be otherwise, but also not victimizing yourself or overly identifying, right? Yeah. Because I think part of the decolonizing the mind, at least for me, was that, yeah, I am brown, I am Muslim, I am an immigrant and so on, but also I don't belong in anybody's fucking box. I'm not, I'm not here to play your diversity theater either. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that it's a really interesting hyphenated existence that we lead. And it's very easy to take that for granted when you're not in being in Toronto because it's just a thing. Half the people here weren't even born here. But you go elsewhere, and Toronto has lots of things wrong with it. But this is the one thing that I truly really appreciate that it's almost invisible how diverse it is. Of course, you go hour and a half outside Toronto, it's a different world. Or if you go to a Tobik, it's a different world. Oh, it's a bubble. We live in a fantastic bubble. Yeah, exactly. I don't know that I, I sometimes dream about living in the country or some mm. idyllic existence. And then I realize that I would be surrounded by people who don't look like me. And I'd be surrounded by probably a lot more ignorance and racism than I am here. Yeah. I have to say, though, at least for me, I still get I get uncomfortable if there's too many people that are brown <laughs> in my inner room. Because then you have like, brown is obviously it's, it's not like a monolith, but you have so many different kinds of people. And, and this is perhaps maybe another question for you. It's like when you say brown, what are you trying to say? It's funny. I've had so many conversations with people who are like, oh, I don't identify as South Asian or I don't identify as this or I don't identify as that. And I think it's fair for me when I'm saying brown, like how to be brown, I'm looking at my experience as a South Asian person. I'm not necessarily including. I know there's like Persian people who call themselves brown and there's Middle Eastern people. I can't speak to their experience. I'm never going to be able to. So I'm uniquely South Asianing, as they say. But it's bringing this back to tip. I am not, I realized I was in a lot of rooms with a ton of South Asians because there's this South Asian renaissance happening in media and it was great. It was fantastic. I can't even tell you. We took over the dance floor a lot and there's just so much uh, joy in celebrating these South Asian stories. And there was a lot of South Asian stories at TIFF. So that's something that I can't agree with you with. I like being in a room full of South Asians. <laughs> it feels really good. Maybe not my judgy aunties. And uncles, yeah. other oh, ones, yes. Point. And I'm glad you're pushing back on this because I, let me rephrase, and I was being a, obviously a little, perhaps a little provocative, but my thing is I ultimately, whether you say brown or not, I think the thing that is inspiring to me and it is, is when people own their own identity in their own way. They're not trying to fall into a box that was given to them, that they were put in, or a box that they think they should fit in. So from that perspective, I, you included a couple, I had a couple of friends who were part of TIP this year. And it did look like it was like there was something very special happening. I would love to learn, like, when you say this sort of South Asian renaissance happening, well, where do you think that comes from? What's actually happening? What does it feel like? There's so many of us. There's a ton of us, and there's a ton of us in media. And I think we're all just finally starting to band together and support one another. And we're a lot of South Asian diaspora are now rising up the ranks in huge positions. There's a Miss Marvel. If you look at Miss Marvel, was directed by a, a Muslim, I think she's Pakistani woman. And there's so many, there's so many other examples of South Asians rising up the ranks. And now those people are now helping all of the rest of us. So there's that. And then I think that we're, our stories are really being recognized by the world. There was the first South Asian horror was at Khan, which was a Canadian film called In Flames. And there was a lot of celebration of that. There was a huge South Asian party th here in Toronto during TIFF as well. That was very Hollywood. It's definitely, it felt like that. It felt like a South Asian renaissance. And it feels, what's nice about it is that we're all really supportive of one another. I'm not trying to fight my way through a white system anymore. Like I have other people who have gone before me, who are helping me, who are showing me how it can be done. So that's a really nice thing. It doesn't feel like the odds are stacked against you anymore like they used to be. Yeah. So I'm from Bangladesh and we, I frequently talk about this. There seems to be a lot of so Bangladesh being, let's say, a relatively late on the migration cycles that have started like Pakistanis and Indians by virtue of endangered servitude or economic needs and things like that have moved. They perhaps moved to start traveling earlier. So the diaspora is a lot older, a lot more established. Bangladeshis are relatively more recent in that sense. And our community still struggles with the sort of zero-sum game that we play. 
right? Either playing somebody else's game or learning not to how to support each other. That's starting to change a little bit with more and more people in prominent positions in media and technology and so on. It's a very interesting thing that happens. And I wonder, South Asians at large, having this sort of deep history of migration for a long time are now on that stage, right? Rage pull others up. The thing that sometimes I get wary of is when you say brown, it just, it's, a, it's synonymous with being Indian. Uh, yeah. Everything's Bollywood. Yeah. Which uh, is something that irks me, I have to say. It's a very big region, South Asia, right? Many it is. different languages. Even within India, a thousand languages, right? Yeah. Which kind of is a segue to my uh, next question about you having Tamil heritage. I know you said that you grew up pretty much white, but at what point did being Tamil... Look, I didn't... My parents, we were cultural. We had, we had culture in the house and stuff like that. And my mom really tried to instill culture in us. I rejected it wholeheartedly. I didn't want to eat curry with my hands. And I didn't... I, I was so disgusted by particularly like our food and our cultural customs until I got older. So we did have that culture growing up. For me, though, I think the big kind of shift was when I was 21, my parents took us to Sri Lanka, me and my sister, and it was the first time I had gone. And not only did they take us into kind of the tourist areas, but they actually took us into the war zone up into Jaffna to see my grandmother. And it was the only time I ever met my grandmother. And that was a huge spiritual and maturity kind of shift in my life. And even while I was there, I was have, I, had, I had started meditating by that point. But even while I was there, I was having really prophetic dreams and seeing things like in temples and stuff. And it was a really huge spiritual moment for me that I didn't realize until much later w what it did, which was give me direction and guidance in my life and in my career. And from that moment, I always felt I, it really changed me. Even when I came home, I was 21 and my friends kept saying, you look different. And I thought, I feel different. And then from there, keeping it, it was more, I was more interested in the customs and the culture, in my culture. And I didn't go back again until 2009 when the war ended. And then from that moment, it was like, I just started spending as much time as I could there. My daughter was born there and I'm there a lot more now. And I do a lot more kind of investigation and research and stuff while I'm there. What part of your culture did you resonate with the most? What caused, which part caused that big awakening? Uh, the spirituality, like the spirituality in countries like that, it's so ancient. It's rooted in the earth. Like you feel it when you walk around. It's not like here where you have to seek it and find it. You have to look for it or else you'll just be living in a haze. There, it's like you get off the plane and I just felt this whoosh, this grounding. And when you're walking down the street, you'll see Buddhist monks. You'll see a, a Hindu, like a Parahara, which is a Hindu parade. You'll see the call to, you hear the call to prayer twice a day or however many. Yeah, it's twice a day, right? I don't know. I'm not Muslim, so I can't. But so these things are just part of daily life. And that really affected me that it could be part of daily life. Because I felt here in Canada, I was raised Catholic. And here in Canada, I definitely felt like I, sh I, I didn't like the Catholic Church at all. And then on top of that, I was ashamed to even be seen meditating or I didn't have any friends who were spiritual. So I was hiding my spirituality. And when you go there, you don't have to. And even when I'm there now, I still go in the winters and stuff. And when I'm there, I'm wearing the, we call it a puttu, but it's also called a bindi. Like I'll wear that or I'll wear holy ash on my forehead. And I don't even think about it. Whereas, and here I'm just starting to wear the bindi. And it's as a way of reclaiming my identity that was really taken from me by growing up in a very suburban, very white city. My dad left Sri Lanka. So in the 50s, there was a law, an act called the Singhal, Singhal Only Act which meant that Tamils couldn't go to post-secondary education, amongst many other things. They couldn't hold certain p positions of stature. They couldn't hold certain positions in the government. So a lot of Tamils sent their kids, the, the ones that could, sent their kids overseas to study. And my dad, 16 years old or 17 years old, took a steamer, steamership from Sri Lanka to England, to London, in the 1960s. You can imagine, like this sort of innocent boy shows up in the 1960s and it's peace, love, and sex. And he wilded out. The pictures are amazing. He had such an amazing <laughs> time. He, like when I, he lived on a houseboat with his buddies and they went to crazy parties and he was going to Black Panther meetings and protesting apartheid. And like, he just really found himself. And he was dating all these European women. I've seen all the photos of his girlfriends from the time. <laughs> And then 10 years in, he decided he wanted to settle down and marry a nice Tamil woman. So he wrote home and he asked his mom and she started sending him photos. And 
there there was a photo of my mom who's very fair skinned and has green eyes and she I, I've seen that photo she's wearing like a mini skirt and she has almost like a beehive and she's standing in front of an open fridge with her hand kind of pointing at the <laughs> to this day we don't understand why are you showing this to the men anyways my dad liked her so he brought they rode back and forth for a while and they had one chaperone visit and I have a photo of that visit also and then they got married and he brought her to England and that kind of started their journey and then he ended up here his company brought him over here so in the 70s I'm curious as you're rejecting your own culture here's your dad who somebody who believed in what was happening and how he wanted to participate even though from a distance I wonder what that what kind of tension that caused growing up Oh gosh it wasn't really my dad was so chill about everything my mom really wanted me to be a good Tamil girl there was a lot of rules they wanted they expected me to have an arranged marriage they expected me to go to an all girls school they expected me to not date and really just until like after university they wanted me to be a lawyer they had a lot of ex- expectations and i was not that person i was this wild crazy artist a whirlwind of a, of a human being and so that i think combined with the trauma of being tamil which is a very real trauma when you live your ancestors have all lived under oppression created a very hostile environment growing up. I, there was a lot of abuse, there was a lot of screaming, fighting, particularly between me and my mom. And the thing with a lot of South Asian parents, they tell you that you're bad before you even have a chance to know what it means to be bad. <laughs> and so my mom was already telling me like that I was this and that. And so I couldn't get out from it. So I thought, okay, I'll just be that. Okay. You already told me I'm that. So I was pretty wild. I was doing drugs. Like I started my the first um, my first drug experience. I was 14 and I did LSD. I'd never even smoked weed. That was my first. Yeah, that was the introduction. So you can imagine, you know, and I was, you know, I was reckless uh, with it. And I, I didn't realize until later that some of the visions and things that I had seen were actually really profound and were calling to me. But I at the time I was just being a reckless idiot. And I left home very young. Also, I left home as a teen. Because I, it was too harsh of an environment and I was never going to fit into that box. Just like you said, the box of expectations of what I was supposed to be. So I left. I was running away from the time I was 12 and then I think I left home around 15. When you say left home, what did that entail? I was living in a group home for a while and then I got my own, I got a shared apartment with my boyfriend's friend. And like he was 18 at the time and my boyfriend and his friends. And, and I got a job and I was working and going to high school and then my our high school vice principal, he hated me. He just thought I was a runaway and this and that. And so he made my life a living hell until I dropped out. He harassed me and harassed me and harassed me every single day, calling me into his office, yelling at me. And I dropped out. I dropped out of high school and just started working. That's yeah, true. I'm a high school dropout. I didn't do so bad for a high school <laughs> dropout. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. You turned out just fine. You turned out. Just... <laughs> In fact, I think there's a lot of us who go through that. It's funny. Like, I, I don't want to call it anguish. But certainly at that time, it felt like some sort of anguish. You don't want to admit it, of course. You don't want to admit yeah. that you don't have control and that you don't know how to process your own experience. I would be remiss if, if I didn't ask you, what was it like to rediscover being Tamil? And I ask that particularly because there's so many stories that I've heard through my friends who have Tamil origin. Tell us a little bit about the story of the Tamil people in whatever way that feels right mm. and how you owned it. Brad, it always goes all back to colon- colonialism, doesn't it? Colonization. <laughs> Let's start there. Yeah. The British came in. They destroyed our country. They split up the, the two different sects of people, the Tamil and the Sinhalese, and they favored the Tamils. And when they finally left in 1947, the, there's, the Sinhala are the majority, and it's a democratic country, and there was more Sinhalese than Tamils. And so, of course, the Sinhala were upset by not being the favorites and and for many other reasons, and started enacting laws and things that were against Tamils. And there were riots in the 50s and pogroms and killings of Tamils in the 50s, which my dad, as a 14-year-old, witnessed. And then this continued and continued, and then there were more so in the 80s. In 1983, particularly, there's something called Black July, which was widespread state-sanctioned killing of Tamils. That kind of perpetuated the Civil War, which was a 30-year civil war between the government and the what most people know them as the Tamil Tigers, they're the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, LTE. So they were one of many resistance groups, but they were the toughest and the most fierce, and they basically destroyed all the other resistance groups. And then the, the fighting was between the government and the Tigers, and the Tigers wanted a separate Tamil homeland in the north. 
And so that went on for 30 years. And that's when my grandmother was there during Black July and had to escape. I actually made a film about her story. I had to hide in a temple and had to hide herself that she, her any Tamil identity she had to hide. And and then in AF, what was it, 2009, the war ended. And it was basically the current prime minister decided to bomb the hell out of the Tamil homeland and killed tens of, upon thou, tens of thousands of Tamils. So many. He, they bombed hospitals and no, no fire zones and all kinds of things. And the Tamils call it a genocide because there were so many Tamils killed and gone missing. And there's still so many that are gone, that are missing that have not been accounted for. That, in a nutshell, there's lots of other ways. This has lots of other details, obviously, but in a nutshell, that's what I grew up hearing about and knowing. And the war was just singularly intertwined with my identity. Everybody talked about it. There was always word coming back. My, my, one of my uncles had to escape and all the, my aunts and uncles all had to escape or leave under duress. So it was definitely a huge part of my identity before I even knew that it was. So being Tamil for me is I rejected it for a long time, obviously, because you reject everything that your parents are. But when I went back, when I started going back and when the war ended, I felt so helpless. I just, I volunteered. In 2009, I said, I'm, it's ending. There's so much devastation. I have filmmaking skills. I'm going over there. And that was the journey to rediscovering my Tamil roots and really, really understanding what it is and who I am. And I'm even learning the language now, which my parents never taught me. That's fantastic. Yeah. One thing I was going to ask you is, I'm asking, I don't know why I said that, <laughs> is this story, this particular aspect really resonates with me because my father was also a freedom fighter during the independence war of Bangladesh and, and West Pakistan at the time. And growing up, he doesn't, he didn't always talk about it, but the war, the sort of hiding in the mud with a gun, waiting for the enemy to come by, that kind of story was like prevalent. I didn't realize how much of my extended family was involved in it until years after a lot of the people, you know, had passed. But I'm curious, because I have drawn the lines this way, is that the sort of rebellion, because I was always the odd one out too in my family. First one to get tattoos, ripped jeans, piercings, heavy metal music. And drinking and all the stuff, getting in all the trouble, getting expelled and all the shit. I want to meet that guy. Can I meet that guy? <laughs> He's there somewhere in a very controlled outburst nowadays. But the way I've drawn the lines now is that the sense of rebellion, the rebellion that my family, that is, that is embedded in my family, the sort of we won't stand for it, we'll stand for the right thing. It's in me. It was just being channeled the wrong way because when you're perpetually playing around in the abyss with no certain purpose or identity, you haven't individualized yet, it can often come out in the wrong way, right? Mm -hmm. But I certainly think looking back now, it was there the whole time, the sense of rebellion. It, was, it wasn't being challenged, right? So I'm wondering, do you draw the same sort of parallels? A hundred percent. I was born, I think, my mother said I was a rebellious from the womb. Like I was a C-section and I was breached and she's from the womb, you were rebellious. I definitely. Yeah, see? <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely feel like that rebellion is part of the Tamil identity, whether we will like it or not. When you're spend so many years oppressed and so many generations oppressed, it, it becomes a part of you. I spend a lot of time in Palestine and I see it there where it's actually, it's beautiful. It's actually beautiful to see this rebellion and beautiful to see it such an intense part of the identity, the Palestinian identities. Yeah, for sure, for me. And I didn't know where to put it when I was just rebelling all over the place and like a Tasmanian devil. Literally, I was so bad as a teen, as a preteen and a teen. I did so many. I always tell my daughter, if there's anything you want to do, just ask me because I've already done it. <laughs> Unless there's something new happening that I don't know. And then we can do it together. But so, yeah, it is. That's and actually ensuring that she will never do what you're asking her to do. So she's probably <laughs> perfectly fine. Won't do it <laughs> Maybe it's probably true. She's, I think that's where it's headed, hopefully. But yeah, that's, I mean, this film, I made Tigress, which is a short film that I, I made that is about that exact thing. It's about rebellion and what rebellion looks like here when we have privilege versus what rebellion looks like in a country when you're at war and like what a 14 year old would do. And I ask myself, I've asked myself that question a lot of times, would I join the resistance? And as a crazy, rebellious, anarchist, 14-year-old punk rocker, yes, of course I would have joined the resistance, not knowing what that would mean or what it meant for my life, making foolish choices because you feel like you're superhuman at 14. Yeah, I, I really thoroughly investigated that when I made that film. And then as part of the Chalmers Fellowship, you had you have gone to Iraq and then Palestine, like you were saying. What parallels did you see there between stories of the Tamil people and then Palestinians and Iraqis? 
Yeah, I've been to Palestine a couple times. I went with the Chalmers Fellowship and I also went on residency in 2019. And I wanted to go there specifically because it is one of the most complex conflicts in the world. Now I don't call it a conflict. I call it an occupation because that's what it is. But I see a lot of parallels with Palestinians and Tamils. It's something that I've been investigating in my artistic practice is like this solidarity and this rebel rebellion and the existence under oppression and occupation and what that looks like. And even in my research, discovered fairly early posters from like Tamil Elam, like the North, saying Tamils in solidarity with Palestinians from like the 1970s, the 1960s, 70s. They have that in Ireland too. Ireland has, has a lot of mm. solidarity with Palestinians for the same reasons. Iraq is a different story. Iraq is, wow, Iraq is a crazy, amazing place, but it's not the same. I think Iraq has a lot more money. That probably makes a big difference. Palestinians don't have money and, and it's designed that way so that they cannot really make enough money. But, but Iraq is a really wealthy place. And so I think that makes a big difference in, in terms of how we see it. resistance is often born out of poverty, right? You have no options. You can't leave. And Iraqis don't have that same resistance, though I feel like they do. And maybe I didn't discover it while I was there because every culture does have that. But their resistance, a lot of their resistance turned into, I would say, extremism, like ISIS and stuff like that, where it just got completely bonkers. So I think it's a bit different in Iraq, though I would highly recommend some people to go there because it is an incredible, you think Egypt is cool. Iraq is next level amazing. I would love to. It, it, it saddens me a great deal that the birthplace of civilization, Syria, mm. Iraq, Iran's still there. It just feels, although this is my own program bias poorly, but like, this entire region is so incredibly rich in history and culture. Going yeah. back so long, the Fertile yeah. Crescent, maybe someday. I feel really saddened by Syria in particular, but yeah. someday. Iraq is an example of it changing. Like they, they're post-conflict now and they are rebuilding. And when you go to somewhere like that, where you see what conflict did and how they're coming out of it, then you can understand that war, come and, war comes and goes. It's not forever. Hopefully Palestinians might believe differently, but or the Israelis, it, it's, it comes and goes. So there's, I think there's hope everywhere. It's where you, where you look for it. And we also have to choose to be hopeful, right? What else? Is yes, there? absolutely. Absolutely. I, I want to come back to your comment or the story you shared a little bit, which is around meaningful experiences that are transcendental, that are mm. psychedelic, for the lack of a better word. That word is way overused, but it's a podcast <laughs> about psychedelics. One of the things that we talk about is psychedelics and intentional use of mind-altering substances. Tell me, you shared a little bit about the first experience at 14 with LSD. Why LSD? What was circumstances? What did you <laughs> experience? Uh, yeah, and then perhaps, I don't know if that was the most meaningful experience or not, but tell me about the most meaningful experience, uh, meaningful experience with psychedelics or plant, subs, plant, wow. plant medicine. Yeah, so I, I did it because it was $5 in the parking lot of my high school. <laughs> <laughs> it was like steep and there. Oh, it's all you know, idea. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like I didn't really know. No one told me what it was going to do or anything. I didn't do any investigation. It was just $5. It was easy to take I, and it, it was easy to get. And, I, and once I did it once, I kept doing it too. And, I, and the funny thing is, is that I would just stay at high school. When I look back, I'm like, why did you just sit? And I would sit in class or I would sit in the library or I would hang out outside. It, wow. So ridiculous. But again, like I didn't really know what it was doing to me. And I do think those early days, like it, they really opened me up in ways like when you look at microdosing and how it's opening portals in your body and it's opening, opening up in ways that you don't even realize. And I think doing LSD that young did that. It helped me a lot to process the abuse that I was facing at home too. And to like, it taught me that there were bigger and greater things out there. And though I didn't know what they were at the time, a lot of times when I was doing that stuff, like I would end up either someone's house, sleeping over, whatever, and I would be transported into outer space. And I would be sitting amongst the, the star systems in outer space. So, and that would be my peaceful place. I, I did that a lot when I was younger. And then I just stopped somewhere around 16, 17. Life got really hard. I was working all the time. I wasn't, I stopped doing anything. And I was sober for a while. And then when I was about 19, I made friends with a, a girl who was a big raver. And I'd never been to a rave. And that kind of, she started taking me to raves and I was always the sober one. I was always the driver. They were always doing all the stuff. And I was like drinking, I don't remember Rev. I was drinking these horrible, those were alcohol and energy drinks and they were terrible, but I was drinking energy drinks a lot. And, and then 
The craziest thing happened, actually. So I was always partying, but I was always sober. And, you know, when you have party friends, you don't talk. I've never talked about being sober. Mm. I just didn't do drugs and nobody really asked me any questions. And then I was at System Sound Bar, which is a big club, electronic club in Toronto back in the day. And a friend, a friend that I didn't know very well, thought they would give me a present and they dosed my water with PCP. Mm. And I had been sober for years, six years. Yeah. That was this uh, this door because it was crazy. I've, I've never done that since. I don't know that I ever choose to do that on my own. But it was like I was in this loud, crazy club and it was thumping music. And I'm sitting on this couch and somebody, a fr- another friend whispered in my ear, what was your earliest childhood memory? And all of a sudden the club disappeared, the music disappeared, and I'm sitting in the forest in my parents' backyard. And the birds are tweeting and I'm just laughing and sitting there. And I was there for eight hours in that forest wow. in my mind. Yeah. And and that but the good thing was that I'd already done drugs. So once I knew that I'd been dosed, I knew that I had to accept it and not fight it and just go with it. And that was the, the good thing. Because I think if I fought it, it would have been a way worse experience. And from that point on, I thought, let's try this. And so what I did, and luckily I was with a friend who prided herself on being very well educated when it came to psychedelics and when it came to all chemical drugs. Like she knew everything about them and she taught me and she said, don't take things unless you know what they are and how they're going to interact with what else you're doing and things like that. So I was in the rave, I was in the rave scene and ecstasy was big back then. And so I was doing a lot of that and that was beautiful. It was beautiful. A lot of heart opening, things like that. But honestly, like LSD has been my first and always love when it comes to psychedelics. I definitely will, even to this day, will do it like twice a year at least as a big reset. It teaches me, it guides me. I journey with it into places that, and and it heals me, it heals me so much. And I've had some really profound experiences on it in a field somewhere when being given lessons and taught things. I also have done it like in conjunction with salvia, which made, basically when I did, that was wild because I left my body and went into, again, went into outer space. And I was next to what I could only describe as the Godhead, like this ever present, all loving being that was just with me. And I was sitting with it for a small amount of time. And yeah, it was incredible. It's so powerful and beautiful. Yeah, large, by and large, I'm 44 now. My experiences with psychedelics have been largely positive. And if they're not, If I'm not feeling good, I know that I just need to lay down or take it easy. The only one time that I had a very intense spirit breaking experience was um, with DMT. And DMT, it wasn't like the pens now, which I feel are very flagrant uses of DMT. I don't feel like that's the right way to do it. It was like a friend, we were in our 20s and a friend was making it in his lab because he was working in a science lab as a student. And that was, I had been raving all night and had done a lot of ecstasy at the time. It was very cheap. We were in our early 20s and, and then came back to their place and they said, do you want to do DMT? And I did not know what it was. I didn't know. I didn't have an understanding exactly of what it was. But I was like, yeah, sure, let's do this. And because it, I had been on, on so much other chemical substances, my DMT trip supposed to last, what, five minutes? Lasted two hours. Holy. Yeah. Whoa. And I went to heaven and hell and everywhere in between. It was frightening. It was terrifying. And it broke me spiritually. And I spent six months afterwards in like a mild sort of psychosis. Like I was not well. I was not well. I thought I was going crazy. And it took a while to come back from that. It was a really, and even to this day, I haven't done ayahuasca or anything like that because that experience scared the heck out of me. And I don't know that I, I, sometimes I think about doing ayahuasca and sometimes, and then I think of the experience. I'm like, I I reach, it is entirely possible to reach altered states through meditation. And so I do that often. And it's not, it's not necessarily as intense, but it is to me. I don't need, when I was younger, I felt I needed psychedelics to get to those places. And now I like them, but I don't need them. And that's the nice, that's a nice feeling. Yeah. And in some ways, I think psychedelics actually makes you appreciate things like meditation even more or breath work because yeah. you just recognize that it's just your mind projecting stuff and that you can go to alternative states of consciousness through stuff that is so innate and in fact ridiculous i can just get there by breathing mm-hmm. a certain way Whoa. <laughs> yeah you know? so it makes you appreciate it so when the stories about drugs being addictive and stuff like that i'm like 
it's funny. I think Eric Andre said, had this line. The government doesn't want you to do your drugs. They want you to do their drug. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's so true. It's, it's so funny, right? So I think it's, you're <laughs> perhaps far more adventurous than I am. I would, I would not take LSD at 14 in a parking lot just because, hey, it's fun. <laughs> First of all, it's too much of a commitment. I, I like to sleep. And then with LSD, it's okay. I'm going to be offline for 18 hours at least. Yeah, but nobody told me that. I didn't know it was an eight hour commitment. Nobody told me anything. That's the thing. And and then I also find people tell you like things that aren't true when you ask them as well, especially dealers. I remember the first time I ever did cocaine. I think I was 21 and I was at a, at a music festival and I came across this guy and we were chatting. He said, do you want to do some cocaine? I said, what's it going to do to me? And he said, it's like someone took a million dollars and put it in your pocket. That's not at all what it feels like, buddy. So I feel like it's like the lesson that I learned early from a very trusted friend was do your research and understand. And it's something that I'm also teaching my daughter, who's almost a teenager. There are, if you want to know about something, let's talk about it. And we've talked about cannabis. We've talked about mushrooms because those things are on the street and they're very mostly legal now, mushrooms too. Do your research, know the good and the bad, know what you should mix it with and what you shouldn't. Know what even happens if you get caught by the police. And those are things that I'm really grateful that somebody taught me because then it made me, I'm just, I've done a lot and I've tried a lot, but I'm not stupid. And that's, that makes, that's the line, right? That's the dividing line. It's if we're going to, when I work in harm reduction also at festivals and I have seen people who, it's like their first festival and they're like, what? And then they take so many things and then they have a psychotic break or they disassociate or they don't know their own name or their own boyfriend's name. Or it's nice. I, I know it now really well, the psychedelic experience, because I've helped and counseled people through their own experiences. No, I agree with you. I, it's not even so much the drug or the substance as the relationship to it, right? So in just the same way, you can have a drink and not have not drink every day. Some people get hooked and that's a different story, but ultimately is a relationship with whatever you're taking. Some people do it to escape momentarily or forever or for other things. Some people do it to relax. Some people do it to enhance whatever they want to do. Yeah. I want to switch gears in the last 10 minutes or so that we have left is I want to come back to your role as a filmmaker. Now, this particular time and place where there's so much polarization, so much seems to be uncertain, ambiguous, and in disarray, what do you think the role of a filmmaker is in this particular time and then do you feel as a as a female and a person of color that there are particular perspectives or vantage points that you feel equipped to showcase yeah as a filmmaker and as an artist in general i think our role is to expose the truth is to really reflect back to society what's happening and how we see it and to maybe touch upon emotions that other people can feel through our work I'm always seeking to, to speak the truth in my work. I'm always speaking to push boundaries on what people think the truth is and to talk about maybe the thing that's unspoken. That's really important to me, really important. As a filmmaker of color, as someone who comes from a background of trauma and oppression, with being my family and being Tamil, what you think the truth is and what we're being told the truth is by popular media, by common narrative, is not the truth. And the truth for me always lies with the people in communities. So I spend a lot of time on the ground in communities, talking to people, hearing their stories and getting permission to tell their stories to the world. I, for me, the strength of purpose that I feel, it guides me and directs me so powerfully, so powerfully. And I think like bringing it back to psychedelics and spiritual experiences, it has all fed into this, what do I want to call it? Like a beam of light, you know, that's guiding me that I'm just in. And I've stepped into it and I'm taken where I need to go. And that's because I feel very strongly like I'm, I have purpose. I have, in my visit to Sri Lanka when I was 21, it told me, you have a purpose. You have a greater purpose. There's more for you here to do. And everything, the universe just gives me what I need to achieve that purpose. And I think a big part of that is just, is telling these stories and helping people really see the truth about what's happening in our world that's not colored by Western media or by popular opinion or by political motives, which is what we always see. It's coming at us every day, all the time. So I think as an artist, that's where, where, then I, I think when I achieve that, it resonates outwards, it resonates with other people. Mm -hmm. And then as a person of color and as a woman of color, we are very, we're in a beautiful time right now and it, it may fade, but we're getting a lot of attention. We're getting a lot of work 
People want to see what we're doing. People want to see our projects and hear our stories. And there used to be this sort of old saying in the industry, there's no story that hasn't been told. And that's, that's not true. That's just, there's no white story that hasn't been told. But we, there's so many stories of color that haven't been told. And here we are and we get to tell them. And, and that's really fun. I think for me before, for a long time in the beginning of my career, I was just making, I wasn't thinking about being a person of color. I loved like old 70s Americana and I was like making, writing stories like that. And I worked with Deepa Mehta. I shadowed her. I was very lucky for a couple of days to shadow her on Midnight's Children. And at one point she walked over to me and she said, Maya, tell me, what are you working on? What are you working on? And I said, I don't know. I have this story about the 1970s in USA. And she's, no, don't do that. And she said, tell, she took my hand. She said, tell the stories of your ancestors. Tell the stories of your father, your mother, your grandmother, your grandfather. Those are the stories that need to be told. And that was directional for me. She, for the flaws that I see in her now with the controversy around the Tamil story that she told, that moment she gave me a gift and she told me what to do. And it, it was, she was right. She was right on. My job as a person of color is to vindicate my ancestors mm. from the oppression and from the trauma that they all went through. They all went through this and they did not have the opportunity and the privilege that you and I have now sitting here having this discussion to interrogate our experience and to investigate ourselves deeply. They didn't have that. Who had the time? They're just working, trying to survive. We get to go to therapy. We get to do psychedelics. We get to do all these things and work on ourselves. If I get the privilege of doing that, then I need to send honor back down the line to them. And the way I honor them is by telling their stories and by vindicating them from the prisons that they were in so that I could be free. I totally love that. I think this whole idea that we get to heal and be free. And so what is the point? The point is now we have a responsibility to tell the, their stories in our own way and it's in a way that feels authentic to us, right? Will that again fall, you know, fall mm -hmm. into a mold of some sort? Their stories haven't been told. We now can tell them, but again, in an authentic way that, that feels true in a way that they, they would mm. appreciate, right? Because otherwise this whole freedom is, there's no point to it. Yeah. It's hard work. It's hard work. It's really hard. It's hard work. Yeah. The work doesn't end, right? To heal. Yeah. No, it doesn't end. Right. To heal the, the, li the lineage. Yeah. It's not just healing me and you, it's healing the lineage all the way down. The last question for you then is a two-part question. First, what's a movie or TV show or whatever else that you saw recently, that you experienced recently that really stands out that you want to talk about? Secondly, what are you working on? Where can we find you? And what can we expect? Recently, I saw two South Asian films at TIFF. I saw Queen of My Dreams by Fazia Mirza, and I saw In Flames. And both of those films, In Flames is by Zara Khan, and both of those films are fantastic. One is a horror film. Queen of My Dreams is like a, well, it's like a com comedy drama. Both of them were just beautiful and beautifully done and powerful and telling, again, telling stories that we haven't heard. So I would say those two are, are my all-time favorite at the moment. And what am I working on? I have myself, I have a, a feature film in development right now that's also, it's a horror. It's an elevated horror set in the jungles of Sri Lanka just after the conflict in a tiny village. It's called The Devil's Tears. So we're working on that. Thing, good things are happening. It's probably going to get made in the next year or so. And I've got, as I said, I have the comedy, the How to Be Brown comedy. And I have a paranormal mystery set in Southeast Asia in 1975 that's coming out with uh, Reflector Entertainment. So that's uh, a series that'll be coming out online too, probably at the end of the year. Lots of good stuff going that's on. Amazing. Very exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. Maya, thank you so much for spending the last 50 minutes or so with us. It's fantastic <laughs> to hear your stories, how you've come to find yourself. And I'm very excited to see all the projects and the movies and the, all the other cool things you're thank working you. on. Thank you. It's great. Great chatting with you. This podcast was brought to life with the help of Carolyn Tripp on art and design. Thanks so much for listening to Minority Trip Report. If you're learning from or enjoying the podcast, please subscribe to MTR on YouTube at Minority Trip Report and follow us on Instagram at Minority Trip. It's a zero cost way to support us and help us spread the word. Please also sign up with your email for new episode announcements, events, as well as our forthcoming newsletter. I'm your host, Rod Suraj. See you next time.